You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is writer, producer, director, Michael Fiore. And we're going to be talking about, oh, this wonderful documentary of his called The Selka. And it's welcome. Good to see you again, Michael. Yes. It was great seeing you at uh, our world premiere in Santa Barbara. I know. It was wonderful meeting you and talking with you and spending time with you. How was that for you to be at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival? That was your premiere, right, of this film? Yeah. Anywhere, a world premiere at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. How was that for you? It was exciting. I mean, you you sit with a movie in the edit room for so long, and I'm the editor of the movie as well. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, so, it, you know, you live with it a long time, and you you think you know what it is and and what an audience like Santa Barbara gives you is really the insight into what the movie is. They always say, you know, when you're watching your movie, don't watch the screen, watch the audience. Right. And that happened on my last documentary, which ironically also premiered eight years ago at uh, Santa Barbara, Floyd Norman and Animated Life. Yeah. And I knew I had a good movie and I was confident in that. But then when I saw it with the Santa Barbara audience for the first time, I went, wow, I have a great movie. <laughs> and it was because the audience was telling me like, there are small moments that I'm, I wasn't thinking were actually like bigger moments. And uh, same thing happened here um, with Veselka, where, you know, there are small moments that I thought were small that people were applauding or cheering or, you know, um, laughing. I, it was just it, it's a great um, introduction to what your movie really is. Yeah, you know, I've said it over and over again. I've said it from the beginning of launching the show that movies should be seen in the movie theater. And, uh, you know, we all of us got really used to during the pandemic watching them at home. And it was harder for us to go back out in the movie theater. But once you get back out in the movie theater, y y it just changes the whole experience. I've seen movies that I've watched at home and then I've seen them in the movie theater. And it's entirely different, your experience and, uh, and your enjoyment of the movie is richer when you see it with other people. I really agree with you. And the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, one of the best in the world, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's a it's a it's a great film festival, and it just gets better and better every year with the types of films. And this year was a really amazing year, and your film was one of those amazing films. Uh, so, what what is it like there when you get? contacted and they say your film is going to be premiering at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. What's that call like for you? Well, this one was was extremely important, not just special, but important because we, given the, the subject matter uh, of the movie, I always say this is not a war movie. This is this movie is an antidote to war in many ways. Um, and while there is a catalyst of war um, on two levels in the movie um it's it's still not a war movie mm -hmm. that being said with the two-year commemoration of the war in ukraine coming up this saturday on the 24th um it, it was really important to me that the movie get out around this time so with that said the movie was completed only just before thanksgiving um maybe a little bit before that like early October um and given that it was like we there was a really limited amount of festivals we could do because I knew I need to get this in theaters by this weekend right, right and so there were very limited high profile ones like a Santa Barbara and when Santa Barbara called and said we'll take you it was like great because we need that validation we need a Santa Barbara to say you're, you're worthy of audiences. And then, um, you know, we're opening theatrically in the Ukraine tomorrow wow. <laughs> across six cities. And on Friday, New York, LA, DC, and New Jersey. And you'll open wider over the following month. But um, yeah, hearing from Santa Barbara was kind of crucial to get validation uh, beyond the theatrical release or ahead of. Very exciting. You also were on a panel at Santa Barbara. Can we talk a little bit about that? What was that panel and what was it that you talked about on that panel? It was a, it was a very uh, prestigious panel to be a part of. So your invitation, I understand, was, you know, it was, again, you know, it was, a, it was a, an honor, I, I would assume, to be asked yeah. to be on that panel. 
that was it, really in many ways a highlight of the festival, even beyond the screenings in some ways. It's always great when you can be put together with other filmmakers, whether it be on the panel itself or in a room with them. Um, but, you know, a very specialized event. And the focus on this panel was, um, I believe they were all documentary films, unless maybe there was one that was not, but I think they were all docs. And I didn't get a chance to see any of them because the three days I was there was so busy, but uh, I'm looking forward to to seeing them. There were a couple of filmmakers I actually sprung up a, a quick relationship with and were in touch. So that's, that's what you gain out of these panels. But what's also awesome is, you know, we had Claudia, um, Hugh from, uh, you know, she's one of the heads of the festival, but she's also the executor, a she's a, ex the director of programming for the film festival. Yeah. yeah. Director of programming, a uh, renowned critic, film lover, film historian. She led the panel and was just a wonderful host for the event. And uh, what was really great was the audience had some of the best questions I think I've ever heard on a, a panel before. And it was a mix of, I think, uh, locals who are not filmmakers, but also filmmakers. And they were just really thoughtful and very deep and um, very heartfelt. Uh, and not just to me, like to the panel. And I think we were all kind of um, surprised in a really lovely way about that. And it just kind of topped off what had already felt very special. Um, but yeah, that, that was a, a real honor to be a part of, of that uh, of event. Yeah, well, you know, this is a movie town. And that's yeah. what's so wonderful being living here now is because it's just so, there are so many people in the film industry uh, yeah. that live here and that just low key. I mean, there's like somebody told me there's 200 members of the academy that live here. That's, yeah. that's a big number <laughs> in one little town. So, and Roger Derling has yeah. done a phenomenal job, um, his 22 years of heading up this film festival, and he's really put it on the map and made it what it is today. And it is world renowned and it is special to, you know, for, for your film to have been a part of this uh, film festival and your first film too. So let's dive into Veselka because it's, it is, it's just a heartfelt film on so many levels i hope my questions are as good as the audience that you had for the panel <laughs> now i'm not now i'm intimidated <laughs> no no please so let's ask away all right well first so the audience knows what is Vizelka about so you, so they understand what we're talking about when we start to discuss the film uh, for those that don't know Vizelka is a beloved new york city ukrainian restaurant uh, it started 70 years ago um, as a newspaper stand by Vladimir Darmakwal. Uh, over the years, he built it up as this refuge for displaced Ukrainians that uh, left uh, that region of the world as a result of Russian oppression during and post World War II. When he uh, passed, in the early 1970s, his son-in-law, Tom Burchard, who had married into the family, you know, full-blooded, uh, red-blooded American, no Ukrainian in him, as he always jokes, he's Ukrainian by persuasion. Um, <laughs> he uh, took over running the restaurant upon Vladimir's passing, um, simply because Vladimir's uh, son and daughter didn't really have any interest in the business. So Tom was this American, you know, in a Ukrainian community, the, the the restaurant resides in little Ukraine in the East Village in New York City. And the Ukrainians were kind of turning their nose up at him. They're like, who's this American boy running our like Ukrainian newspaper stand? Right. And he decided, well, you know what, I'm going to start infusing like my own style into this. So he not only had like the little Ukrainian dishes that were at the countertop, the way his uh, father-in-law had them, but he also um, started to bring in kind of more American fare too, because he started to realize he was losing that Ukrainian audience. And one of the big things that saved him was uh, the city gave him a chance to be one of the first stores in New York City to sell lotto tickets. Those became so big, he became hugely successful. Cut to all these years later, during the pandemic, he was kind of forced into retirement and reluctantly he gives up the reins to his son Jason who had worked in the restaurant since he was 13 
And so what you what kind of watch in real time is is Jason taking over amidst a pandemic and then the war in Ukraine starts and a majority of their staff is Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So already Jason had big shoes to fill. Um, but then you throw a pandemic and a war into it and it's really, you know, you're watching the challenges one guy is is faced with um, and also so how he kind of learns from the relationship he had with his own dad in the workspace over the decades, how he kind of alters his approach to be like the warmest surrogate father that he can be to his Ukrainian staff that needs support. Yeah, he's got such a big heart, <laughs> I mean, such a big heart. And everybody who he, he had a hard time ever turning anyone down when they did come and ask him for any kind of favor. But, they, you know, just a great, loyal um, staff. And that's really wonderful to you know see in a restaurant, in the restaurant business, because there's always so much turnover in that business in general uh, that, you know, it's nice that these people have been there for a long time and, and have that family feel because it does have that feel. How did you... Um, what made you decide? Because this film started off as one thing and then ended up into another. So um, how how and when did you start filming and why did you decide that there needed to be a documentary about uh, this wonderful restaurant, Veselka? So I, I first started meeting with them, uh, it was November of 2021. And the war was not a glimmer in anybody's eye at that point. Um, so I had broached the idea with their 70th anniversary coming up. It ju just happened this uh, January. I proposed the idea of doing a documentary that really talked mainly about the three generations of kind of father and sons, um, as well as the challenges of, of handing over a business. And they were also going to be going into a renovation. So it was going to cover this big kind of transition that occurred. And we do cover that in act one. Act one of the movie is day one of us filming. So cut to many months later, after me pitching them in November of 2021, they kind of sat on it and they liked the idea, but they were just not sure. And then the war started and I called them and I said, look, if there's a time to tell your story, it's now. You, your father-in-law and your grandfather, they, he started the storefront as a result of war and if there's going to be any resonance here in your story it's like obviously we don't want to exploit what's going on with the war but this parallel is too crazy not to try to dive dive into it and they agreed still took them a little bit uh to kind of come on board even with the war starting so act one is our first day there and it's uh the 11th day of the war mm -hmm. And then you'll see what happens over the course of act two and three is the movie takes on a whole other shape. It's like two different movies. It's like a Ken Burns movie in the beginning, looking back and kind of setting up the characters, the dynamic between father and son. And then act two and three, you're more in like the present future. Um, and it becomes a very cinema verite. Like you're, you're living in their world. There's really not any interviews and you're just seeing the story happen and unfold in real time. And there's a, there's a few surprises that I could have never predicted uh, in a million years. But um, yeah, just life happened. Yeah. Do you want to talk about any of those surprises? Well, I'll, I'll say first, you know, spoiler alert for those okay. who <laughs> might be going and seeing it, whether it be now or on a streamer down the road. But uh, it um, the movie really explores the 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 conflict that some of the staff have as well as their families have uh that are in Ukraine first these is the initial they're separated by war will they ever see them again right. um but then there's also uh Jason takes the initiative to bring people over and uh employs them and it's very interesting to see how in the two little bubbles that of, of, you know, example we have of like Ukrainians now having the American experience and this, this kind of idea of, okay, they're physically safe. What it is now to have that uh, new, new life. You see in one of the bubbles that 
the the two twin sisters are are very torn in one breath they're saying to jason we love being here we love being near our american family because their son works at the restaurant and then he walks away and the son starts talking to them and they're like we want to go home we don't want to be here and they knew the cameras are rolling the whole time but they they just showed that conflict immediately then you have another character whose mom comes here and it looks like it's just going to be a month visit and then she's going to go back and i won't give too much away but she embraces america in a whole other way and oh dear you're so freezing up a little bit me. michael okay let's hope we sure. unfreeze okay let's see all right no you're moving in slow mo. Well, keep Let talking. Maybe it'll pick back. Let me know if you go back. Let's see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. There you go. Internet connection is unstable. I don't know if that's okay, you. Let me know if there's. Okay. Do you? No, it's all right. You just Let's keep going. See. I. Okay. What? Just... Um. Where should I go back? Just, just um about the 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 mother that came over. I mean, you were you were talking about how, cause you know, she wasn't going to stay very long and. Oh, okay. So we'll go back to the last. Yeah. yeah. Um, she wasn't going to stay very long. And then she kind of, you want to go ahead and talk about that. Yeah. So, so then there's the other bubble, which is uh, one of the Ukrainian managers. Uh, his mother uh, is brought over by Jason and she looks at the, opportunity of a for the other family there not only for the audience but her own son um and so we we, we go through um that storyline as well there were moments um, um, but at the end of the day jason is always nope did i lose you yeah, I can't hear go. you. Keep going. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It keeps freezing up for some reason. So sorry. Uh, so uh, if when you were the, 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 the manager who brings his mother over, he was a very, um, very emotional numerous times during this. I don't know if I'm giving anything away. I hope I'm not, but you know, he was very torn about being in America and he wanting to go over to the Ukraine to fight mm -hmm. and was very conflicted. And there's a scene uh, that I just thought your photographer did an amazing job with this film in general, but that particular scene when he kind of just says, I can't talk anymore and, and walks away and the camera just follows him. I thought that was a very moving just to watch, not, you know, intrude on him any further or, you know, not that you're intruding on him, but, you know, filmmaking's tough. And you're, when you're a documentary filmmaker, you're right there all the time. And, you know, and the people that are on the film are not, you know, actors or not trained. And, and I'm sure this is very difficult for them to always have a camera on them. I mean, is that what you found during the filming? In the in in the beginning, yes. The that first day, uh, and you see it in the movie. I had to infuse myself into the story on some level, which I that was never my goal. Um, I think Act One became something completely different than what I wanted it to be, but it was out of a need to tell a story because no one would talk to me, and it was not unexpected. I mean, it was day eleven of the war. That Jason and I have always said. That first couple months, the only thing I can compare it to was the feeling New York had during 9-11. Uh, mm -hmm. And it wasn't just on that corner in in uh, little Ukraine at Veselka. It was like anywhere you went in New York, I mean, there were uh, protests and, you know, groups with flags and doing all these different events that were very pro-Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it just, there was a kind of a chill across the entire city for a couple months. That's gone now. Um, and and I will say there's there's an interesting, and I hope this changes very quickly, but I'm, I'm even seeing with, in the way people are picking up on this movie, I think people are almost afraid to 
promote or touch it because they think again it's a war movie and it's not no. in addition to that it's it's just you know it's pro-human <laughs> it's pro-compassion all right yeah. and i think in the case of this war it's black and white there there is no way here like they're talking about that last invasion that occurred a week ago could could they, they now have air control over that region the russians do they said they the if they're not given support the whole country could topple in the next year poland will be next so i don't know why people are i, I guess this is a media cycle thing but like people need to keep this on their radar as if it's just starting because NATO is next right. and this movie's not political and I don't like to get into that stuff. No, it's not. But it's not political. When I see media like not sure if they should touch this, I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> this is this is important. That's interesting. That's interesting that you're getting that kind of that uh kind of reaction from the media. You know, I, I, we talked a little bit at the film festival that, you know, people in oh, the just real quick, I just wanted to add it's not just media though. I mean, it just even Going speaking with um, just one quick anecdote to add to that. Uh, I just want to be clear: it's not really just like a media thing. It's it's just kind of social media. It, it's like an overall kind of response to you know just the movie being out there. And one in particular was I reached out to the in the airline industry who does distribution for the airplanes. And they said, oh, just the mention of war, we like none of our buyers will touch this movie. And I laughed and I said, I've sat watching people watch pure hardcore violence on a plane. This movie has no violence there. <laughs> and you're telling me not a single airline will book it. That's very frustrating. Wow. Wow. Very frustrating. Just because there's a mention of war. Yeah. Something's got to change. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. We, we were talking just about, you know, th there was this war and then we have the war, you know, with Hamas and Israel and all of that. And everybody's right. just kind of, do we all start as Americans? I think we all start to put our head in the sand and just, oh, it doesn't really affect me. And, right. you know, you move on, but, you know, it does and it could uh, very much affect us. And we're not really looking at what those long-term consequences could possibly be. So yes. your film is not a war film. It's not, it's, it's a beautiful story and it brings to light more of what, so, we, I mean, I think what I love about documentaries is that we learn so much about various uh, aspects of life and people that we may not have come in contact with ever. Mm -hmm. You know, how many of us, I mean, you know, if you live in New York and you've gone to Veselka because it's been there for 70 years and, and you went to it when you were in school because it was nearby, right? When you were going to the Tisch School. And people know this restaurant. And in fact, in the audience in Santa Barbara, there was a woman talking about how that was, it's part of her life, you know, and her children have grown and they bring them back and they all go to Vitsoka. And, and she gave a powerful statement about this restaurant. So um, there's there's that. And it's about the stories of these people and, and how beautiful they all are. And so for many of us who have never been around uh, Ukrainians, maybe a lot of Ukrainians in one, you know, one area, um, it, it opens our eyes, you know, to really how they're feeling, what they're going through when this is going through. Because, you know, this young man's mother um stays and her and her husband's still over there in the ukraine i mean i thought that was really fascinating too yeah it, it, i think the best movies um and documentary as a whole they pull back a curtain on some area whether it's an event a person you know a moment in time they pull back the curtain to reveal something new and different that the majority may have never seen or thought of before. And I would say to people, you know, if somebody goes, oh, why would I care about this little restaurant in New York City? I go, why does the world love the bear right now about a fictitious Chicago restaurant? It's because if you're a human and it moves you, you will connect with it. And I guarantee audiences will watch this movie. Even if they live in Timbuktu, they're going to watch it and they're going to cry. They're going to laugh. Mm -hmm. They're going to go on a journey with people that um, 
have an important story to share, not just in the immediate, but the story that goes back 70 years. And I think that that's the power of documentary. Yeah, I agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. That's why I love what I do. And because it gives it shines a light on documentaries and independent filmmakers and uh, documentaries are, I think, I, my, my favorite genre. Um, I, and I saw a lot during the film, during the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. There was a lot of wonderful documentaries and yeah. yours was definitely one of those high on the list. So I wish you, this is showing now. It's in, uh, it's showing in theaters across the country and it's, um, will Will soon be rolling out to more theaters and then on a streaming service going down the road. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the hope, my last documentary opened uh, August 26, I think it was 2016. And as I was walking into the theater based on the New York and LA times reviews, I got an offer from Netflix that's on opening day. Right. So may the theater gods give us that same <laughs> event crossed. in the next yeah, couple of days. Yes. I wish you much success with this, Michael. I really do. It, it's a wonderful documentary. Please, everybody, seek it out. It's a it's a wonderful story. It's it just it, you're right that you laugh, you cry, and you learn a lot uh, about this wonderful restaurant along the way. So, wish you much success. It's a beautiful film. And thank thank you. you for being on the show, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.